Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, joined now by the leader of the United States Senate, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. Good morning, Mr. Leader. Great to have you back. Good morning. Glad to be with you. You know, I've probably talked to you three dozen times on the air over my 20 years on this show, and I always talk to you about judges, so I'm going to start with judges. And I've got the classic question, what have you done for me lately? You've, you've actually saved the Constitution with 50 appeals court judges, two Supreme Court justices, 133 district court judges. But my old state of California just needs Mark Scarcy and Rick Richmond. We, we need some district court judges, leader. Well, we'll work on that. It sounds like, what have you done for me lately? It is. What it is. Well, <laughs> well look, look, we're going to do the we're going to do the fifty first circuit judge in the Senate uh, today, and at the district judge level, you know, the Democratic senators still have some pull, so the administration is trying to work out some kind of compromise uh, deal because at the district court level in the Senate, uh, we still. You know, the Democratic senators still have some say in all of that, and the administration's trying to negotiate with Harris and Feinstein, which, as you can imagine, is not easy. Now, you know, there are some decent Democratic would-be judges like John Flynn in California. Now that Senator Harris isn't running for president, Senator Feinstein has always seemed kind of reasonable on this. Do you think we can get a package to get Rick Richmond renominated, Mark Scarcey confirmed, people like John Flynn nominated? Is that doable in an election year? I hope so. I hope so. Um, you, you know, we focused. I have since I'm, you know, don't try to tell the Judiciary Committee how to run their business. I, I basically focus on the circuit judges, where we uh, do not allow the Democratic senators to to, to veto them with the so-called blue slip that you've probably discussed with your audiences before. The blue slip is still alive for district judges, and I'm sure what's going on in California is a negotiation between the White House and Feinstein and Harris uh, at the district court level. And I know that there are a lot of vacancies that need to be filled. But the good news is we've changed the Ninth Circuit in a dramatic way, as you know, and it's no longer, you know, the... Uh, the, the the far left court that it used to be. No, I argued before the Ninth Circuit seven years ago, and I won uh, amazingly. And I didn't have to go to on banc. It used to be the the land of no return if you had to go to an on banc panel in the Ninth Circuit. Now, because of your judges, you actually get a fair shake. You mentioned Andrew Brasher will be confirmed today. I noticed that a nominee from Mississippi was not returned by the White House. Is there any uh, word on that, Leader McConnell, as to whether or not that nominee will be coming back or a new nominee? No word on that. We have had difficulty filling that seat. There have been some internal uh, differences on the committee over the nominee, and that's still under discussion. But we're certainly not going to let that language uh, pass the end of the year. Now, my, 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 my motto for the year is leave no vacancy behind. That, that includes uh, district courts as well. And so we're, we're a long way from being finished with uh, doing court confirmations this year. Any advance word, any inkling of any retirements from the Supreme Court? No word. No word on that. Um, um, nothing other than the rumor mill. All right. So tell me a little bit about uh, senior status eligible judges. If they retire and announce now, is there still enough time for every senior status uh, eligible judge who takes senior status to have a nominee uh, put forward and confirmed. Yeah, there still is, and uh, we're going to continue to do that to the end of the year. Obviously, the senior judges need to to let the White House know in advance of the actual date, so that we can be prepared to move with a new nominee. As I said, my my motto for the year is leave no vacancy behind, and that's exactly what I mean. I think it, I think it is also one of President Trump's great calling cards for re-election among a slice of the conservative movement, which is significant. Do you agree with me that there is a at least double-digit percentages of Republicans vote on judges and judges alone? Absolutely. I think I think the right of center world cares a great deal about the courts. They've seen uh, activist judges and what they uh, tend to do for many years, and that's why I think that the, the decision that, that I made uh, to leave the Scalia vacancy open until we knew the outcome of the election was widely applauded on the right, had a lot to do with President Trump's solidifying the Republican vote. Many of Republicans at that particular point were skeptical about him, wondered what he'd be like. I think that reassured them, helped him win the election, and he didn't blow the opportunity. 
Uh, Neil Gorsuch has, has been outstanding, and Brett Kavanaugh as well. Now, let's talk about the impact of impeachment on your drive to keep a majority intact. There are some vulnerable Ameri- uh, Republican senators. Martha McSally is a good friend of mine. I will be over there. If, if I was allowed to campaign, I'd knock on doors. But I work for NBC, so I couldn't for Martha McSally. Cory Gardner, I've known forever. Same deal. Susan Collins has more respect from me than almost anyone other than you in the Senate. David Perdue is a great guest. Tom Tillis is a great guest. Five vulnerable Republicans. How are they faring after impeachment, Mitch McConnell? Well, I think impeachment worked for the Democrats sort of like it did for us back when we impeached Clinton. Clinton's huh. approval rating went up and ours went down, and it, 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 it's no accident that President Trump is sitting on the best numbers he's had since he was sworn in, and it happened to coincide with their effort to impeach him. Every one of these races that you mentioned are in better shape now than they were when impeachment started. So I think we can safely say in the short term, for sure, that impeachment was a loser for them and a winner for us. Is there um, any danger that the energy level fades with time? Because the the resistance never seems to ebb and flow. The Republicans seem to get up for a fight like Kavanaugh, the impeachment, and then go back to their business. Well, you know, passions do ebb and flow. and uh, But I think our people are fired up. I think we're going to see a, a, a massive turnout. Uh, on both sides, and we'll find out on Election Day in November who, who benefits the most from that. But I think it's going to be a very high turnout election. The stakes are big. The Democrats have never been more different. I mean, their their idea of a moderate these days is somebody who's in favor of the public option as opposed to Medicare for all. Well, it's the same thing. It's just a question of how, how long does it take you to, to get there. And they've made it very clear they want to get rid of the Electoral College. They want to expand the number of the Supreme Court and other courts in order to to offset what uh, uh, we've been able to accomplish with uh, the last three years. So this is genu- genuine radicalism on full display. I mean, the current leading candidate is a self-avowed socialist who went on his honeymoon to the old Soviet Union. Oh, my goodness. That's not Bill Clinton's Democratic Party. That's a, a new version. And even the ones who style themselves moderates are not by any normal standard moderate at all. Now, you're up for re-election yourself, Leader McConnell. Have the techniques of campaigning changed in Kentucky like they have everywhere else now? Data-driven deep dives into search engine identification of likely voters. Does that come to Kentucky as well? Yeah, I think the, the thing the Democrats have done the best I have to hand, hand, take my hat off to them is the online fundraising, the Act Blue fundraising. I did get my, my opponent, for example, announced and received $5 million in 24 hours from over 200,000 donors. You might say I'm her finance chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they don't, they don't have any idea who she is. They know who I am. So they've done a great job of, of, of pulling together small-dollar donors online. I think that's a big uh, difference from years ago. We're getting better at it. Uh, for your listeners, the website that we use is called Win Red, and um, it's doing much better. I don't think we'll catch up with them in one cycle, but there are a lot of enthusiastic um, uh, online uh, donors and Fox News watchers and Hugh Hewitt listeners who also, you know, care whether we win and they can pick up their iPhone and go to Win Red and give their 10 or 15 bucks to their favorite candidate. Uh, now, Leader McConnell, going back to a traditional problem, um, the head of the ticket, the president, has sometimes not meshed well with lower parts of the ticket. Is there that integration this time between the Trump team run by Brad Parscale and the various Senate leadership committee um, and Senate majority committee and, and your committee, are they all meshed up? well, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's participating. For example, in the issue I was just talking about, everybody's participating in Win Red, the Trump campaign, the RNC, the Senatorial Committee, the Congressional Committee, and our candidates were all uh, uh, in, in the same space. Uh, the, uh, this this uh, Trump campaign is going to be dramatically better run than the last one. He won the last one. So I think... Uh, They're cutting edge in every uh, part of a modern uh, campaign.
Okay, now can I talk to you a bit about debate? Eric Trump started the hour with me. He said there's no way they're going with the Presidential Debate Commission. It's full of anti-Trumpers, even the Republicans. My suggestion is that the president names one, the Democratic nominee names one, and those two agree on a third, and that they just do that three times. What do you think is going to happen with debates in the fall between Donald Trump and whoever they nominate, whether it's Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, or Mike Bloomberg? I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the, the candidates voluntarily participate, so they they have some latitude in shaping what it looks like. And uh, uh, that'll be an interesting call for the president and his team as to just what they want to do with debates. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not inclined to predict what's in their best interest in the fall. What What is your assessment of the media generally, Senator McConnell? Has it become more unbalanced than normal? I think there's always been a left-wing bias in the mainstream media, at least the Manhattan Beltway media elites. I think it's become more pronounced. A few people have stood against that. What's your assessment? Yeah, I think it has gotten worse. I think they suffer from Trump deranged syndrome, much like the uh, and the Democrat uh, majority in the House. Uh, they just, you know, can't stand the president, and it affects their behavior. I mean, look look at um, the speaker tearing up the president's speech uh, on television right at the end. Um, th- th- you know, that's not the kind of behavior we expect of our public officials. So I think it. I think it's uh, also picked up by, by the left and the media. Yeah, you're right. They've always leaned that way. I think they're more aggressively that way now. All right, two impeachment questions to finish off the historical record. When the Chief Justice received the question from Elizabeth Warren, he engaged in the Chief Justice Darth Vader stare at someone. Was he staring at Senator Warren? Well, I think there's no question Elizabeth Warren was trying to get the Supreme Court, get the Chief Justice in the middle of this political maelstrom we were having in the Senate called a trial. And um, the Chief Justice, of course, did not want to do that. Um, no, no Chief Justice would be uh, very pleased to be presiding over a trial in, in a political body like that, even though the Constitution requires it. And I think the Chief Justice did a good job of staying out of it. Now, and the last question, if you had to pick one of those lawyers from the president's team to represent you in a political trial, a lot of great talent there i have my favorite who would you pick gosh i hate to <laughs> hate to pick one I, I thought they did a fabulous job pat cipollone and jay seculo uh the two deputy uh, white house counsels also did well it's like asking me which one of my daughters is my favorite you i think i i think i liked them all they did an excellent job i'd pick pat philbin i know they all did an excellent job but i'd pick pat philbin leader he was He's exactly what you want in a lawyer, kind of low-key and persuasive, determined, not unlike a lot of people I know, but uh, I'll spare you the the second question. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, don't forget those California district judges. Thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.